Eric, remind me why we're doing this episode again. Well, um, mainly it's because we both like Dr. Zerdos right. and we just, you know, we, we could bring him on to talk about anything. Let's be honest. So it's true. We want to embrace, encourage, and support all our friends through all phases of their life. Uh, mm -hmm. So when, you know, doctor, even mistakes, even, yeah, like that they, they, they'll later certainly find out more mistakes such as leaving lifting to produce, uh, pr pursue uh, endurance training. Mm. But Mike Zordos, Dr. Mike Zordos, is back on with also Dr. Sarah Mahoney to talk about endurance training, lifting, the intersection, the utility potentially of lifting if you do decide to do endurance training, and also the reverse. If you're a lifter that w wants to dabble, maybe. And I, I made it clear because I know the cult. Where they're like, yeah, if you want to do middle distance, which is like basically, uh, you know, uh, several kilometers or, or what have you, to long distance marathon training. So, like, yeah, whichever one you want to do. I'm like, nah, they would start with middle distance. Ain't nobody, you know, what did you say, Eric? Uh, Eric, what was that amount? Um, 20, 30 hours of total road work per week is what you work up to. That ain't me. Yeah. No, when you're looking at being an ultra athlete, yeah. it, it's a, it's a part time job. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, but, might as well get uh, paid, yeah. Eric. Absolutely. And and you don't, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so ain't, ain't nobody want that smoke, but uh, no, but in all seriousness, folks, um, there's a lot of reason people, people lift and Omar and I are grudgingly following our own purpose of why we created iron culture, which is to unite all lifters, cool. uh, including those who don't even lift as their primary mode of exercise, which right. while distasteful to our spirits, mm -hmm. um, still falls within the venn diagram of what iron culture is about so uh we we are actually no in all seriousness we're delighted to have dr mike zordos back on once again uh for those who don't know not only can the man or has the man squatted 500 pounds but he's also ran marathons and he's been getting very seriously into it and uh, because of this dual expertise uh reach researching programming uh, periodization, auto regulation, as well as concurrent training, uh, and now getting into running marathons, he has a lot of expertise. But he said, "No, no, Eric, I am not the expert on this, and this is why we bring on the experts." Expert, he said, "My friend, Dr. Sarah Mahoney is, and folks, she's got a PhD in exercise physiology. She's a fellow of the ACSM. Uh, she's an associate professor, and she also uh, coaches Division One and Division Two track and cross country athletes. So uh, Sarah is 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 truly." Um, you know, very knowledgeable on, on this topic. And we talk a lot about how lifting can potentially be beneficial for endurance athletes. Uh, and this is a, a different conversation than, uh, like you alluded to, Omar, whether or not uh, lifters should be doing cardio and does it potentially have an interference effect and all of that. Uh, this is more of looking at, all right, well, how can lifting be something uh, that, that benefits endurance training, which is a, a unique paradigm. And I think even those who, who don't necessarily uh, have an interest in becoming an endurance athlete, there are some, there are some interests here if you want to get more into any type of, of running. Because as Mike talks about, there's a difference between um, doing this to compete or doing it to complete as we get into. So we, we cover the whole gamut, folks. I think you'll enjoy this. And for those of you who, who do want to uh, dip a toe on the other side of the fence or maybe just fully straddle that bad boy, um, then this is the episode for you. Man, Eric, I really should read the show notes before we begin because had I read them, I wouldn't have agreed to this episode. Just give a 10-second summary of what we're talking about and then I'm going to completely flip the script. So what we're basically talking about is how my love for my friend Mike Zerdos eclipses the judgment I have for him. So you feel um, it too? Okay. I mean, yeah, I feel the love and I feel it too. I forget how the lyrics go to that song. But the point is, is that um, this episode is actually going to be not only about endurance training. So just to throw a bone out so we don't lose all of our listeners immediately. But the in, in service of endurance training, we should say lifting weights. Um, so yeah, we, we've got one of our, our, our regulars back on, unfortunately now, uh, Dr. Mike Zerdos. But we've also got a new guest, which rehabilitates that decision on our part. But Omar, I'll, I'm going to kick it over to you. Yeah, because I, I think what we should really do today is just have an intervention, Eric, because we consider Mike Zordos, and I'll say the royal we, a friend of the show, uh, mm -hmm. a friend for a long time, someone instrumental in the lifting community, the strength community, the, you know, <laughs> DUP uh, research that he conducted 
power training, a bunch of different things that he brought to the table that basically helped revolutionize the way we look at training. One of the first individuals that did everyday daily max effort squats, uh, which once again was one of those things, the role of specificity. Mike has been all up in this grill, in the iron cult, contributing research, elevating other people. We recently had the conversation training to failure. Who do we have on? Zach. Where did Zach go to school? Oh, I don't know where Dr. Mike Zordos went to. He has been instrumental to this community. And he has turned his back on us in the pursuit of what? What? what, what how, how, how can I be charitable? Because I have many adjectives I want to say. But he's doing something that isn't hoisting anymore, Eric. And I just feel that he's forgotten who he is. And that's what this episode should be about. So we're so we're we're pivoting yeah. to talk about the fall from grace that yes. that, that, that Doctor Zordos has had. Yeah, I think it's a solid pivot. I'm sure our guests uh, didn't see it coming because we explicitly did not tell them about that. <laughs> um, we should probably do some dil- dil- do some due diligence um, yeah. and and talk about Doctor Sarah Mahoney, who's also coming on. That's true. Um, we like I you. Mean, the first impressions positive. Well. I mean, I think we need to get the the, the, the deets first before we decide if we like her, because because yeah. she might be the dealer. She might be Ooh. the 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 gateway Inverted. drug to yeah. this exactly. Yeah. So I mean, cult leaders always seem nice when you meet them, and then you find out there's Kool Aid involved, there's a compound, and there's a spaceship coming, and you're like, hold on, that wasn't in the the first pamphlet you gave me. Um, and of course, that cult I'm talking about is endurance training. Um, right. But anyway, uh, the good news is Sarah is 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 well versed in this cult, you know. So she's got a PhD in exercise physiology. She's a fellow uh, in the ACSM. She's an associate professor. I just found out she's been the chair of her department for years, um, which uh, which which I don't know if that's impressive or just is just something that we can all look to her and go the discipline that requires if anyone's been in academia. So, uh, but she's also um, she's also an athlete. She, I think you competed at the Division Two and One level in cross country and track. Is that accurate, Dr. Mahoney? Uh, I competed at Division Three. Division Three. I'm sorry, I elevated you far too many steps. I add, if I add them together, though, I, I get mm-hmm. that right. Perfect, so. exactly. Yeah. So anyway, t- tell us a little more about yourself, Dr. Mahoney. Uh, sure. Okay. So, um, I do research now with endurance training, um, and I do ultra endurance training. So kind of the polar opposite Mm. of what you guys, um, do. So the research that I've done, um, looks at nutrition in, um, athletes running hundred mile races, um, 24 hour events, that kind of thing. Um, and I got into that basically just, with my own uh, running. So I ran track and cross country in college. And then um, I did some trail running and some ultra endurance events. And I kind of do all the stuff now, um, tracks all the way to ultras. Um, And then I do some coaching as well. So I coach um, at my current university as an assistant coach. And then I have a small coaching business on the side uh, where I work with a lot of trail athletes and ultra endurance athletes. So you coach at the Division One and Division Two level? Is that accurate? Yes. See, I knew I knew that I remembered something correctly from what I was reading about you. So, so there. See, now now I've rehabil- rehabilitated myself. People know why I'm dumb. You got it yeah. perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, thank you for being on. Uh, for those who are mass subscribers, uh, you may be familiar with the name. Yes, it's the same Sarah Mahoney who's contributed there. So, um, just just killing it in all sectors. It is a true honor to have you on. Uh, all jokes aside, um, Omar, are we ready to let Dr. Zordo say anything? I kind of wanted to lay it a little longer. Yeah, well, what I was going to say is we're not, Dr. Zerdos, I do consider you uh, a friend. We're not silencing you. We're not censoring you because you do have a platform. We're not deplatforming you because we did invite you onto the show. But we will filibuster this episode should you try and contribute. And we will just direct all questions to the person who's been longer, uh, the head of the department or on the uh, department chair, Sarah Mahoney. Um, that, that's just the, the structure of the episode. So it seems like it's kind of insinuating something, how we feel about you, but it's more just a time restriction thing. Like we want to go to the expert about this topic, right? Yeah, I would agree with that, Omar. Definitely. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's great. First, I just want to say it's great to be back here on the stronger by science podcast. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> you, know, you guys look great. I appreciate the invitation. And uh, it's just good to be back on in general. So I, I know all about this podcast. I've listened a lot to it. And uh, I kind of know what to mm-hmm. expect. Well played, sir. Well played. All right. So, uh, so, so, so the, I think, I think, uh, I think we can, we can get to the, the meat and potatoes of this or, or maybe as we would say in, in your world, the pasta and goo, I, I don't know what you people eat. I assume it's just carbohydrate gel and pasta all the time. Um, so, you that, so Sarah, anyway, you people, you people. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that was um, with the introduction. That was the first time I've ever been referred to as a gateway drug. So that was a new one for me. <laughs> We're all about first here at Iron Culture, and uh, and you're and you're welcome. So so yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You know, you know, the ironic thing though is that you didn't say that's the first time I've been uh, referred to as a cult leader. So oh. we'll, just, we'll just Eric we'll did just let catch that, that damn. <laughs> no comment. No comment. They're perfect. Perfect. All right. So uh, the reason why we brought you folks on is, is for those who don't know, uh, Mike, could you share with the Iron Colt uh, your, your actual your, your background with endurance sport and what you're into these days? Sure. Well, I, I, first, I told you this in confidence, Eric. So here we go. Um, it's what it is. <laughs> yeah, I haven't really uh, uh, talked about this a lot or training in general, but I'd say a year and a half ago, I uh, contacted... Uh, uh, one of my really close friends here, uh, Sarah, who's on the podcast, and I asked her to coach me and said I wanted to start training full time for marathon running. And I've been doing that for the past year and a half, and it's been pretty fantastic. I've loved every second of it. Some old injuries that kept creeping up in the way of powerlifting became too insurmountable to enjoy the process. And uh, for me, it's always been about training and just mm. needing to do something and to be able to put my, my just full effort into it with no restrictions, not go to the gym feeling miserable. And I had a little bit of background, not in structured training, not to call myself a runner or anything like that, but, you know, from uh, uh, playing soccer in college at the same uh, uh, division three level that Sarah ran. So we have the athleticism of normal adult humans. And uh, so from, from doing that, and then after that, getting into marathon running and ran ran five marathons while I was training for powerlifting. So I didn't really train for the marathons. In fact, for the first one, I signed up uh, the night before. Um, essentially, I was, watching, I was watching television. I was in my master's degree, and I was home visiting my parents on uh, spring break. My dad and I were watching uh, TV. I just finished lifting weights. And they said the streets in downtown Washington, D.C. will be closed tomorrow for the national marathon. And uh, my dad goes, could you finish that? And I remember in college, I ran a 1051 two-mile uh, as part of the 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 uh, uh, soccer season and and the preseason, I was the best runner on the soccer team for whatever that's worth, right? Which isn't a real run. And I was like, of course, if I can run, you know, a five minute bare maybe sub five mile, I can finish a marathon, old man. Just relax. And uh, so I sign up. I haven't run in like three months because soccer season ended. We go down the next day. Four four hours and forty eight minutes later, I crawl across the finish line. Um, and then, so do a few more, get better, but don't, I don't run for 10 and a half years. And then, uh, contact Sarah last year and, uh, helps me out. And Sarah has just been, uh, pretty amazing, uh, to just do my training every day, um, puts it on the sheet for me and I'm able to do it. And, uh, we've put in quite a few miles. We've done so far a solo marathon, a 5k and a 10k over the past year and a half in terms of races and haven't gone in any real races uh, due to COVID. Uh, those mm. have all been solo, but but hopefully we'll get those up at some point. But been improving, enjoying it. And uh, again, for me, it's just about doing something that I can put my 100% full effort into and enjoy uh, and, and know that I can train as hard as I possibly can with no restrictions and improve. And so whatever that is, um, uh, lifting or, or, or running or anything else, it's never been that important to me. So this is my goal for the moment and I think for the for the long term. So that's my background in it, which is is not anything even remotely close to Sarah's background in endurance exercise. Well, I think it, it speaks to the fact that, uh, that that you you reached out for to her to coach you. So uh, we got the coach and the athlete on today, which which is fantastic. We get in the inside take. Um, Sarah, let me ask you this from a coaching perspective: Do you see it as a a benefit or a potential barrier? that Mike has so many years of resistance training under his belt. How does that come into, into play uh, when you take him on as an athlete? 
Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, one thing with Mike in particular is that he is super coachable. Um, he really does exactly what I ask him to do. Um, and that honestly is a big part, I think, of uh, he's been making so much progress over the last year. Um, I think when you coach someone who has a background in power and strength and team sports, one of the hardest things to learn is how to take it easy. Um, you know, a lot of endurance training is a combination of running hard and running easy. And most athletes have the hardest time running easy. Um, that's one of the hardest things to learn. And so, um, you know, when working with Mike, I think my one of the first notes I put in his log was just <laughs> telling him to slow the F down. Um, <laughs> that was in the original work. email. You said, slow the fuck down. <laughs> <laughs> I, did. I did. Yeah. And uh, I made him wear a heart rate monitor. I was like, I don't want you to go any faster than this. Um, Cause a lot of, you get a lot of cool adaptations when you go easier and it makes the whole process more enjoyable. Um, so I knew that coaching an athlete like Mike, that would be the bigger challenge is holding him back rather than uh, getting him to do enough. He's, got no problem doing enough. It's more trying to get him to train at a nice, comfortable, relaxed pace. Cause I think that's a hard skill to learn. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I think that the idea of pacing is not one that we really have in resistance training. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> and, and actually just to, to, to the, I, I uh, take this as a compliment, Mike, but I, do you remember when I first met you, I asked if you'd been in the military? I do. Yeah. So for those who don't know, I, I did a one enlistment in the Air Force, but that kind of attitude of just um, solution oriented problem solving and being very coachable, I, I definitely see that in you. And I've always thought uh, that, that you would have done very well in the military. Um, but anyway, uh, that may or may not be a compliment, but but nonetheless, I, I could see how you'd be totally coachable. Um so we're talking of today about, for those who didn't get it in our long winding intro that included jokes about, you know, cults and whatnot, um, we're going to be talking about how resistance training actually can play a role in endurance sport, which might be a little, you know, counterintuitive to the listener. Um, when we talk about resistance athletes or, or strength and power athletes performing endurance training, it's often talking about, okay, how do we avoid this becoming a problem? So framing this from the perspective of how do we use resistance training as a tool to help endurance athletes is something really interesting to me because I know nothing about that. Um, so I would love to get an idea. What is the overall picture of the data on the topic of lifting for, for endurance sport? Coach, you want to start? Sure. Um, yeah. So generally speaking, um, doing some kind of resistance training that includes in, in the, res, uh, the literature that we have heavy resistance training, that's probably pretty different than your all's definition of heavy resistance training. Um, but lifting hard and doing plyometric type exercises generally is beneficial. Um, we see improvements in primarily running economy, a reduction in perceived exertion. Um, and then in some literature, we'll see improvements in time trial performance. Um, I think what's really interesting about the literature as a whole is that there's not one program or methodology or approach that's really been proven to be superior to another. Um, generally, adding some type of heavy lifting or plyometric training is beneficial, but there's not a lot of nuance in the data. Um, it seems to be when you add some of this to endurance athletes, they do better, but that's kind of as far as the data can take us so far. Interesting. Yeah, I agree. Mike, you I got think, more to add uh, to that? Yeah, man. It's uh, r running economy is the big is the big word, right? So that's what all of these papers you look at talk about. Hey, resistance training can improve running economy, and sometimes they have a direct measure of running economy. Let's say like a resting VO two, and sometimes they don't have a direct measure of measure of running economy, and they just kind of talk about it. Think of it like a practical lifting paper that talks about specific skeletal muscle adaptations, but doesn't measure them. Right. That's mm -hmm. what happens a lot of times where they're they're light on mechanisms, but they mention them. And so running economy, if we think of all of the things that encompass running economy and Sarah could probably fill me in if I'm missing missing one. But, you know, cardiovascular efficiency and adaptations, um, uh, metabolic. And then we have, you know, things like your, your training itself, but biomechanical and neuromuscular. 
And I, I would say that those are really where resistance training comes into play, right? So we know biomechanics can affect lifting, just to draw some parallels for, for the listeners for lifting. But for neuromuscular adaptations, you know, we, we, this goes back, I would say, to the overall concurrent training picture, right? So we, we tend to think of concurrent training in, in this world of lifting as a negative, right? We hear the term and we freak out. Okay, I'm going to have to move around for five minutes of consecutive exercise today, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose everything. The world's coming to an end. Then, of course, there's a, a bigger discussion of that, right? Concurrent training really isn't all that bad as long as you manage it appropriately. The shortest version ever of this is choosing if you want to maintain muscle mass, choosing something like cycling over running, separating your, your endurance cycling by 24 hours from your lifting and things like that. Just making smart decisions to attenuate the interference effect that happens with, with endurance. But concurrent training is also how runners can use resistance training. And so when we think in that back to that running economy and that uh, biomechanical and neuromuscular aspect, well, let's think of the adaptations that occur with resistance training that can be beneficial. Sarah mentioned explosive strength and power. Okay, that can be beneficial if you're getting toward the end of a race and you need to maintain stride length or let's say attenuate the loss of stride length, right, when you're fatiguing. Um, if you're going to become more efficient, more biomechanically efficient when you're running, if you need more uh, 2A fibers to also to increase the oxidative capacity of muscle, but also be able to produce some power toward the end of the run. And then what don't you need from lifting? What you don't want to do is put on size, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so in the first person ever to come on the Iron Culture podcast and talk about lifting not to put size on, right? That's, uh, you know, so if we think of the parallels to how lifters think about it, hey, what are the benefits I can get from cardio, if you will, as they say? Well, I want caloric expenditure to fit into my weight class or, or, or so forth. But I also want to maintain muscle mass, right? So you have good things and bad things that you want to accomplish. For resistance training for runners, you have the good things you might want to accomplish, which is possibly some explosivity toward the end of a race. And it also depends upon the, the, the distance you're, you're running. Are you a marathoner or are you training for an 800 or a mile or something like that? So. I think we have to consider all those aspects, but running economy is, is the big one. But within running economy, there's, you know, four or five different things that we have to consider. So the data is supportive, but as Sarah noted so well, there's little on specific saying, hey, do exactly this. And there's a lot mm. left open to interpretation and resistance training, but we do have discussions of what type of periodization, you know, how to program this. So for me, the bigger discussion around how to do this is, how to program it within a week, right? And, and I think that's something, you know, I'll step back and, and let you guys go from there, but how to program this rather than more on the macro level, because you have to think of what you're trying to get out of it. It's a small part that may improve your running, not, not the main thing that you're doing. So I, I tend to think of it in a, a weekly form. Gotcha. So I, I guess I, I have a, I have a follow-up question before we get into the programming aspects. When, when we say quote unquote running economy improves, what are we talking about is actually happening in the body that results in an improvement in running economy? What do, what do we postulate there? Well, the way that we typically measure a running economy would be actually measuring your oxygen consumption at different intensities. So I would put you running a 10 minute mile and measure your oxygen consumption. And then I would bump you up um, to an eight minute mile and measure your oxygen consumption. And if you have changes in your running economy, basically, to do that same submaximal workload, it costs you less metabolically. So, so are you suggesting that I could do a eight minute mile and that would be submaximal? Because that's let me just say thank you for that. But uh, but you you go ahead. <laughs> my bad, my bad. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it is the economics of the movement. And so it's basically doing the same thing, but you, it is easier for you to do. And therefore, you can do it a little bit longer. Okay, gotcha. I think that, that, that helps. Um, so how does uh, lifting directly impact running economy? Is it just that if force production is a little higher, you can move your body through space easier? Is it as simple as that? Or are there other adaptations we're looking to get at the uh, at, at the physiological level that are uh, in, impacting this? I think, I think there's a lot of unknowns. So at the physiological level, one of the things that, you know, we might postulate is, you know, if, 
if muscles are, you know, one of the reasons you might not want to lift, let's say for hypertrophy, if you're increasing myofiber size, then the diffusion distance of oxygen from the blood to the mitochondria is, is going to be larger. That's going to take more time, mm. right? And you want that oxygen to be able to get there more quickly, right? Especially as you're running, you have mitochondrial biogenesis. So there's more mitochondria and there's greater capillary density. There's more places for this oxygen to go. You're not looking to increase uh, myofiber size. So how you how you program is is key for that because if you're programming in a way that you're trying to build muscle like we would talk about typically on on this podcast um that's probably going to be a negative and that's going to increase the diffusion distance of oxygen from the blood to the muscle and then when we talk about what's going on else physiologically in individually on a biomechanical level right what somebody's gait what does their stride look like Right? And I'm not somebody that's going to be super well-versed in gait. I'm sure Sarah can speak to this better than I can. But what somebody's stride look like, what exercises they need to do to be able to correct that. And then, as you noted, Eric, we also talk about uh, the neuromuscular efficiency aspect and whether it's more asynchronous firing when somebody's fatiguing and being able to maintain stride length a little bit better. Uh, and then if you can do all of those things, and then you have that in training, if you have a harder workout or, or something where you're pushing a little bit more one day, Perhaps you get a little bit more volume or a little more higher quality in that work. And over time, that translates. Just think of, you know, I, I try to draw parallels to myself, to lifting, because it's still what I understand better. And so, you know, I think of it if you can improve your ability to train your biomechanics and now you're able to perform sets of a squat at a certain load at a 5 RP instead of a 7 RP, you can probably handle a little bit more volume. I think it's the same thing that's going to happen a little bit in running. And so I would go back physiologically and talk about that diffusion distance of uh, oxygen from the blood to the muscle, talk about somebody's individual biomechanics and how it might affect gait, and then talk about the neuromuscular adaptations. And if you can still have uh, you know, some semblance of muscle fiber conduction velocity, then toward the end of a, a race, you can transmit these impulses quickly. Um, and you might be able to outkick somebody at the end of the race or whatever it is that uh, you know, you're, you're looking to do. So I think resistance training can have those different facets. And then when you program, as, as Sarah talked about as well, you know, there's the, the, the literature is, yeah, one to three days a week, 30 minutes a time for, you know, uh, uh, explosive and power exercises or strength exercises, something like that. Very light on specifics and open to interpretation mm. in the programming. aspect. Interesting. Yeah. You know, there's a, we talked about this, I'd say briefly, Omar, on on uh, on Iron Culture before, where uh, periodization is relatively narrow in its scope when we talk about it purely for resistance training, especially if we're talking like the concept purely for one type of adaptation from resistance training. But there's almost no question uh, of the utility. Uh, I would even argue the necessity of some elements of periodization when we're talking about training for highly different goals, like in team sport athletes or an endurance athlete who is who is lifting weights. Um, presumably, in my mind, you wouldn't be able to maintain and you wouldn't want to maintain the same training load in, in the weight room when you're close to a, uh, a race as you would, say, earlier in the off season. So, so what is this manipulation of volume, intensity, and frequency, which in my mind pretty much is periodizing your training, uh, look like for, for an athlete who's preparing for a race? I know it's a broad question, but take, start 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 wherever you want, and and then then bring it home. Yeah, I think what's interesting is, in some sense, as a runner, you don't you don't really care how maximally strong you are. You know, it doesn't really matter what that number is. What matters is how well you run. And um, this may also seem counterintuitive, but running is a powerful motion. Um, maybe not compared to, you know, powerlifting, but if you think about the biomechanics of what you have to do, you're going to put your whole weight down on your foot and then rotate forward. And then your entire body weight has to be pushed off just by your toes, you know? And so to be able to do that, at, especially at higher velocities, you really do need to be powerful in your lower body. And so, the idea, um, what you're trying to get with resistance training is to be as powerful as possible without some of those negative things that Mike was talking about. Um, and so 
you want to, with every stride that you take, it's really helpful if that is um, less than your maximum strength, you know? And so that RPE gets lower and lower with each of those powerful strides that you take. Um, so what a lot of runners will do is if you think of a running season where there's kind of an off season and a preseason and kind of the heavy middle and then tapering towards the end, um, you'll focus on building strength in more of your off season and your preseason. And that's when you'd be lifting the most and lifting heaviest. And then it makes sort of the middle section of your training. Um, that's where you have to have some individualization with how much you can handle. Um, but you're going to start to bring down the volume of your lifting and bring up uh, the intensity. And some runners like to go down more to just one or two days a week um, with their lifting at that point, because again, you're kind of riding this fine line of maintaining your strength and power and not actually causing soreness and inhibiting your ability to run fast. Um, and so then you'll see kind of the same pattern near the end of your season where you will taper the volume, maybe increase the intensity, um, as you're tapering for your race. It makes a lot of sense. Eric, yeah, can I have one thing in there? You can add as many things as you want, Mike. It's quite the change from the animosity you started on the podcast with saying that I wasn't going to be able to speak much. What, what's happened in the past uh, 30 minutes? Or our so? producers, Mike, our, our producers in our ear, they told us the TikTok crew, TTC, of Iron Culture absolutely loves you because they think running is going to be the latest fad. At the very least, it'll be highly memeable. So mm -hmm. they told myself and Eric, like, play along is what we've been told. I didn't yeah. understand any of what you just said. Uh, <laughs> just neither. go with, the, with, with this is a positive turn for you, and, and I think you should embrace it. Are we on the internet right now? Uh, we, we, are, we are on the line. That's unfortunate. It's, well, this hey, thing's well. going to need all the support it can get if it's going to make it, because it's been struggling from what I hear. Um, the one thing I wanted to add... With your is, donation, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to do it. Uh, the one thing I wanted to add is... Uh, capitalizing on some of what Sarah said and then going back to the last question in terms of the mechanisms is, I think we're also trying to accomplish changes in muscle stiffness. And so for, for lifters, if you, if you think of muscle stiffness, we often talk about this, and this is illustrated in the concept of static stretching, right? We talk about, do we want to stretch or not before we embark on a training session? And without getting into the nuance, because just like in current training is nuanced, stretching is one of those topics that's very nuanced as well. But we'll, we'll save that uh, for, for a moment and just say static stretching prior to exercise can decrease muscle stiffness and decrease force production. That's a true statement in and of itself. Now, that's really only the case if you hold stretches for, let's say, 60 seconds at a time, and practically we're not doing that. So if you stretch for 10 seconds, it's really not a big deal. But it can decrease muscle stiffness. Now, by decreasing muscle stiffness, if you think of uh, uh, a length that um, the muscular tendinous unit is held at, and if you stretch it out and then let it go, it should snap back. And that's what you get the stretch shortening cycle. But if you stretch it out and hold it for a long time, acutely, instead of snapping back, it's going to lose that recoil, right? And so it's the same thing. If you take a rubber band, you stretch it out, you attach it to the end of a desk, and you leave it there all night, and you take it off, it's going to lose its uh, elastic recoil capability. And so when you're running, and as Sarah talked about, right, it is, it is high, a high power exercise, which, you know, again, something like powerlifting is a funny name and extent because there's not a lot of power involved in powerlifting, right? And so, but it's, it's powerful when you're pushing off the ground. But what you're doing is you're using the stretch shortening cycle. Now, over time, when you train, you can increase leg stiffness or increase muscle stiffness, but also increase compliance. So if you think about compliance, now what's compliance? Compliance of a muscle tissue is when it's able to tolerate more of a stretch. If you think acutely, when we said static stretching can harm performance and you stretched out that muscle, it doesn't recoil. But chronically, when you stretch, you're also doing, other, chronically when you train, you're also doing other things with the resistance training. You may add sarcomeres in a series and you're strengthening those fibers. So when a muscle is now held at a longer length, not acutely, but chronically, it still gets its recoil. So you're increasing muscle stiffness, but also compliance. And so with, with resistance training for running, you're training the stretch shortening cycle because this is training it over and over. 
we did some old studies when I was a student looking at static stretching and it showed it decreased uh, endurance performance. But what's interesting is to, to go back to Sarah's other explanation is when we did these early studies, we also found that static stretching uh, negatively affected running economy. And the way that we measured this was that we had individuals, let's say, um, uh, uh, stretch 50 minutes of static stretching one week and then no stretching another week. And they ran for 30 minutes at the same speed. At the same speed following the static stretching, they had greater caloric expenditure, meaning they had to work harder mm. to do the same task. And that's when that muscle stiffness was acutely decreased. So over the long term, resistance training can increase that while also simultaneously increasing compliance. And so I think that's one of the other goals we're after is, is muscle stiffness. And so we have to understand the mechanisms, things like sarcomeogenesis, which we aren't going to necessarily get from just running that can play a role into this and make somebody more powerful. So then I think the question is in all of the literature, we see some of the same issues in this literature that we do in lifting, which is the studies are short, right? You're looking at six, eight, 10 week studies. And Sarah, we just talked about this briefly um, uh, whenever yesterday or, or the day before, whenever it was about how um, some of these studies, it's very possible that these individuals just weren't lifting at all these runners before they started the study and now they do and you have two groups of runners and they can run maybe an 18 minute 5k it's pretty good and uh they're not lifting at all one group starts lifting the other group doesn't lift and they see a pretty drastic improvement um but then the question is how long does that sustain how do you need to program past those six eight ten weeks in the study the same questions we have with some of these lifting studies so anyways that's a very long drawn out add-in um, but I wanted to explain it just kind of, I, I, I neglected to mention earlier, the muscle stiffness aspect. And I thought that spoke to the physiology of it. And Sarah's answer reminded me of that. So hopefully that was uh, a helpful chime in there. But since I know that I only get to answer one question based upon the intro of the podcast, I'll, <laughs> I'll uh, resign now. <laughs> no, I think it's very helpful because I think if someone understands that, uh, you know, stiffness and compl compliance effectively make the force transference from the muscle to the tendon of the bone to move the body more efficient and doesn't burn as many calories, that ties back into running economy quite quite well. So um, so we're glad we listened to the TTC on that one, and that that is clear. Uh, Omar, you look like you were going to say something. I don't know if you just had your mouth open. No, I was going to say that that was in protest. I, I, I was actually okay. routinely going to object, uh, but I decided, I'm like, you know what, this sounds interesting. I do wonder, just because we're using the catch-all for endurance training when we're describing this, that we have middle distance and then long distance. So middle distance would be like a mile, uh, long distance, maybe a marathon, half marathon. How these considerations change? Because we hate when it comes to training, when they lump powerlifters, bodybuilders, weightlifters, all under the same roof. I'm assuming that there are uh, you know, tweaks that need to be considered when we're talking that middle distance versus long distance. So... From what we've uh, talked about, resistance training, everything else, uh, what would those considerations be, middle distance versus long distance? Yeah, it's interesting. Some of the research um, does some of that lumping together, which is too bad, um, that they will put something like two mile, 5K, 10K together. Um, and then maybe marathons are a little bit harder to do pre and post. It's hard to get someone to agree to a pre and post marathon for their time trial. Um, so a lot of the literature is sort of in that middle-ish distance category. Um, but certainly the goal is a little bit different when you have middle distance athletes, especially on the shorter side. So 800 mile um, they're really focused on building strength and feeling powerful. Um, then when you get to the marathoners and even in like the ultra um, mountain type of ultras, um, they're lifting a little bit for a different reason, um, which I think goes into how they program it. So the idea there is just more to delay fatigue. Um, and so to have more fatigue resistance, um, I don't know that there's good literature that really supports supports doing that differently within the context of each of those training paradigms. So generally speaking, what we have to give to people is, hey, heavy lifting and plyometrics are beneficial. They do these good things. But I think those types of athletes approach adding resistance training for different reasons. So they have a different goal in mind when they do that. Mm. 
You know, it's interesting. Omar and I both have a, like a little bit of a background in sprinting. Um, I was on the like the very tail end of what would be considered sprinting, running the four hundred meters. But um, yeah, this is the, we're talking high school. So just to clarify, like you know, the background is way back. Um, so <laughs> the the interesting thing I've observed now that I'm in uh, like the, the university where I work, we work closely with uh, High Performance Sport New Zealand, which deals with a lot of the training of, of, of high-level athletes. And it's interesting seeing visiting athletes from different countries and talking to traveling SNCs, how even in sprinting, the world of sprinting, lifting weights is not necessarily ubiquitous. And we often think it should be or it would, but it's just interesting to me that there's a potential trade-off there. Like, yeah, I'm lifting weights, I'm trying to get, I'm moving for definitely the same energy system as lifting weights, but even then, do I want the added muscular bulk uh, is it is it worth it? And you can actually find some sub ten sprinters who don't do a lot of lifting, or the lifting they do do is kind of questionable, as if it is lifting. So it it is interesting just how much variance there is across the spectrum. Um, as a follow up question to that, how much does it need to change if the modality is different? I know you're both runners, but if we have someone who is let's say a cyclist or a triathlete and there's swimming involved. And maybe maybe I'm asking the wrong two set of researchers for this if you guys are, are more focused on, on the running side of it, and that's fine. But I do wonder, um, when you've got a movement that is not very stretch shortening cycle dependent or doesn't have a strong eccentric component like like cycling, does that does that change the name of the game? Are you looking for different adaptations or or what's up with that? I, I would say that it, it could in some cases and maybe in others it couldn't. So let's, I would say, let's talk about where it couldn't. And I'm theorizing a little bit. I'm not super well-versed in this area of research as, as you alluded to, Eric. But, you know, if somebody is uh, a cyclist and is really long duration, right, doing, you know, some of these multiple day races and, and you know, obviously people won't watch the Tour de France on television and there's so many uh, instances of things like that throughout throughout the world, where there's multiple day cycling races and going up hills and downhills and things of that nature. You know, what are the parallels to running? Well, obviously the cardiorespiratory and metabolic efficiency, but you're also not going to want to be very big, right? So it's the same. It's a similar concept when you're going for that long of a distance. That mass that you put on is going to hold you back. Now, it's really the case that mass holds you back, Eric, but and uh, and uh, in that in that situation, uh, you know, it, it's it's not something that you want to do. So, if a runner is getting ready for a really long distance race, runners can be underweight, but they can put some mass on, and it's gonna it's gonna be a negative. The same thing with the long duration cyclists. However, as you pointed out, cycling doesn't really have the eccentric component, right? Mm -hmm. So, you're not necessarily worried about um, promoting the stretch shortening cycle in that way. But you're also not dealing with the eccentric damage that comes along with it. So people can point to things anecdotally. If you look at cyclists that are going for some pretty shorter duration races, their quads are huge, huge, right? And they're they're building muscle through the cycling itself. They're building muscle through a lot of the anaerobic uh, movements that they're doing. But it depends upon the length of that race. So I think for and, and again, you talked about how some sprinters don't don't lift. But if you look at a lot of 100-meter sprinters in the Olympics we just watched, those men and women, they're strong, right? They, they it would not be a super terrible transition for them to uh, uh, move on to powerlifting or bodybuilding if they so chose to, right? It wouldn't be that difficult for them to do so. So I do wonder if by just training the same energy system in that sport, they are getting some of those similar adaptations. So while the cyclists may be getting bigger quads because they're lifting, I think the cycling itself, especially the short duration, is getting their legs pretty jacked, right? Because mm -hmm. you're not always seeing the same with their upper body in those individuals, right? You're seeing it in their lower body. So it has to be somewhat specific to that type of exercise that they're doing. Then can The question then just becomes, too, can lifting enhance that, right? I, I, I find it interesting because if we talk about even lifting, let's say, like in an American football player, how much does that help? I think it helps in a general sense, but somebody says, hey, we do uh, a sports specific exercise in the gym for this football player. No, you didn't. That, that, I don't know if that exists, right? You, you, you're trying to mimic what they do on the field in the gym. I, I don't know if that, you can't directly measure that transfer. That's a very difficult thing to do. 
So I, I think the cycling in and of itself does some of that. I think you could theoretically probably get away with a little bit more in a cyclist than a runner just because of the eccentric component um, and not having to worry about that damage. Um, but I'm not as well versed in the data. So that's some, some theorizing for you. Mm. Well, I was going to say, uh, Mike and Sarah, this is, this is the time where I let you know where the vitriol on my end comes from. And I'm going to pose it as a question because, uh, I want you guys to provide maybe an example program one for someone that's considering middle distance and then two, someone that's considering long distance. And here's where it comes from, Eric. And this is story time. Now let's go into the history. Let's go into an anecdote here. So first, uh, when I was, uh, just started as a trainer there was an individual that was training that was training for a 10k i had not trained at all for the 10k but we made a friendly bet uh to race on the day of the 10k i was just doing my deadlifts doing my squats all those things you know uh probably eric 13 percent internet body fat i was actually lighter at that time because i was doing a little modeling like 160 let's say anyways come race day this guy's been training six to eight months and I ran it in like, I don't know if this is good or bad, a 10K, 47 minutes after not practice. And he ran it in 51 minutes. So I beat him by four minutes. And that's when I decided myself running stupid. But that's not where the vitriol originated from, because this is a true story. This is actually where I drew a little bit of my ire. Eric, check this out. Up into grade six, all the schools that I went to had uh, track and field, right? So I did the sprinting, did the relay race, 100 meters, life is good, hurdles, every, they, everything. Did all the events, right? Then I entered uh, another school for grade seven and eight, and maybe they felt as too combative track and field, but they did away with it. It was very bougie schools in the beaches, but there was no track and field. This is a true story. All they had was a running club. And I said, this is fucking lame. I actually said that to the gym <laughs> teacher, but I had it. I had to stoke my competitive fire somewhere and do something. And I actually tried to instigate with the teacher. Shout out to Mr. Minta. A, a track and field but like you basically needed the teachers to agree to do that because it'd be extracurricular and nobody was about that life if you want to do a little art project if you want to do long uh, distance because like that teacher was all about it cool so and that followed me all the way eric to high school the uh, follow-up high school i went to was uh let's just say there were not the resources to have once again track and field so i was removed but it all started with this long distance running that i did enjoy and yet all these beach kids like <laughs> This feels so good. Like, I feel like I'm pumping my heart and I'm doing this as a man. This, this is, you don't, you don't know nothing. You're not, you don't do any sprinting. So that, that's where the ire started for me. And then when that guy basically challenged me, cause I was like in shape at the time and he was doing the, shh, 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 like he would do it on the treadmill, shh, shh, shh. like, you know, his like running training. And I said, all right, man, like Eric knows me, I'm competitive. You want to do this? Let's do this. And I showed up and I whooped that ass. I was like, all right, this is lame. So that's why. I bring with me a little disagreeableness, but I'm willing, Olive Branch extended, I want to learn now, those that want to maybe have the combination concurrent training for middle distance, because I, I do think, and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, where you said you like to commit 100% to what you do, that there is that appeal with the marathon training where I, I would assume it's more total hours and all those things. But for the Iron Cult, because I am the avatar, the living embodiment of the cult, I would tell you this, the middle distance for sure would be the thing I'd probably pursue first. Like I would, I wouldn't go from nothing to marathon, right? I would look at like a 2K, a 5K, a 10K, Sarah. So can you talk with those considerations in mind? One, how you would uh, try and program if you want to do resistance training uh, and also middle distance and then how that would differ, of course, when you do long distance. And that's why I, I believe I explained where my angst comes from. So there you go. First, can you do the can you do the running motion again? <laughs> I mean, his That's so Mike. You know how loud commercial gyms are. Dude, yes. Buddy was on second floor. We're on the main floor, and if you could hear, I could hear this dude. I would say Eric, it's performative. Like I, I sound like the biggest hater known to man here. But Eric knows it's commercial gym second floor. We could hear him over the gym music. Come on. Uh, it's it's probably like the guy grunting on deadlifts when he's got like a ten rep set, and you can hear him on the first one. It's like, <laughs> stop it. But I, if you I, don't I hear it. him, but if you don't hear him, did he do it? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's the same question of a, you know tree falls how, in the forest and no one's there. How long? Uh, how far across the gym did he walk while being pumped up to get to the deadlift bar? So like <laughs> like the length of time. Shout that out, you, Lee Norton. Exactly. 
We're talking about like Lane Norton Reloaded here. Right, this is oh yeah, yeah, perfect. You got it. 2011. Which, which Reload? Yeah. yeah, right. So, you know, that's it's they have to take those things into consideration. But yeah, I appreciate the yeah. running motion. I'll let Sarah jump on this question, but uh, I just I just primarily wanted to chime in to see that motion again. Yeah. I enjoyed. It. I, I just felt that wasn't being descriptive enough. And so I, I had a I had a demonstrate demonstrate it, you know. Email, email. It was really Thank beautiful. You. Really Thank just you. great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, that's a big question. So when you want to add, I'm sure you guys have talked about concurrent training from a lifting perspective, but from a running perspective, you know, if you are really excited about lifting and want to add a little bit of running, that's a really different thing than if you want to maximize your running performance. Um, and mm -hmm. so it just depends, like how you would program that is really different depending on what your ultimate goal is. So do you want your lifting to support your running? Or do you want to see, hey, maybe let me dip my toe into running and then do a little bit, but still maintain my optimal lifting? Um, I think those are just two different things. Eric, well, which one do you want to go with? Yeah, yeah. well, let's, let's take both in order. You, you go for it. You just, you just opened up the Pandora's box to, to then step into and jump out of. Oh, like boy. Bird. Okay. This is intense yeah. now. Um, <laughs> okay. So... I mean, I think if you are wanting to get into more middle distances, specifically if you're going shorter on middle distance is kind of a big category, but let's say you wanted to run a mile as fast as you can. Um, there's a lot of ways to train for the mile and adding a few days a week of high intensity running um, to your existing lifting can certainly give you um, significant improvements. So if you don't run ever, and then you go for eight, 12 weeks, adding just two or three days a week of running and interval training, that will certainly make a big difference. Um, so you don't have to do a ton of running if you want to do something short and powerful like the mile. Um, if we're talking the 10K, 5K, 10K, um, then you probably want to add more days of volume and easy running um, to your training. And that's, I think, where we talk a lot more about, okay, how is this actually affecting my lifting performance? Um, I think those two goals are more challenging to juggle. Mm. Um, you know, if you then are saying, okay, no, like, let's just go all in on the 10K and I will lift appropriately, then you would be doing more um, kind of how I described earlier where far out maybe you'd want to be strong but if you're coming from a lifting background what we would probably do is move you down in volume maybe maintain the intensity um, but focus on just a few running specific lifts you know and so the lifts that show up in the literature for this most frequently would be squat leg press weighted lunges um, maybe you'd see some step ups or other single leg exercises um, so those specific exercises are what you'd probably include. Um, but then I think there's, um, you can even take the volume of your lifting down a little bit more and sub in some plyometric exercises um, because the plyometrics seem to be just as beneficial as the heavy lifting, but they may not be uh, quite as damaging or just make you quite as tired. Um, so kind of a, you do a little bit of everything in that scenario. Mm. Are you are you going from more heavy lifting to more plyometrics as you get? And this is kind of going back to that periodization question. Are you moving from basically, you know, traditional loaded movements to then more plyometrics to then tapering that off and competing? Is that the typical pattern of periodization for a, a competitive runner? Yeah, although like you mentioned, you know, nothing is really ubiquitous. But yes, the um, you would keep the plyometrics in the whole time, but okay. reduce the volume of the heavy lifting and maybe rely a little bit more on the plyometrics near the end. That's, I mean, ultimately, I guess a plyometric is a little more specific since you're moving your body through space rather than a barbell, right? Yeah. Mm. So what is the uh, actual number of like, like the frequency of days per week and the total amount of time spent in the gym? What does that look like for your average uh, maybe not average, but what would you recommend as far as the different phases, actual time spent in gym for, for an endurance competitor? Well, one, you're going to laugh at me in that I have no idea how long it takes me to lift. <laughs> so time spent in gym, I don't know. I can tell you which lifts to do. Um, <laughs> hey, sets and reps is fine too. Whatever, whatever gets us there. <laughs> Rest periods are a non-consideration for people who are in shape. We understand that. But for me, when I do a triple on squats, huh. it's going to take some time before it happens again. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Um, I think what we most commonly see in the literature is twice a week. Um, mm -hmm. You see a lot of variation, so that's not everybody. There's exceptions in both directions. Um, a little bit more frequency seems to be better. Um, there's one literature review that looked at um, total number of sessions and those who did over the course of the study, more than 24 sessions did a little bit better than those who did fewer than 24. Um, but generally, I think these types of athletes will do this about twice a week. Um, and then it will be just this, usually the same lower body exercises, um, probably just four to five exercises. Um, so not a lot of individual exercises and then so maybe starting off with two sets and working your way up to four or five sets as you get stronger, um, kind of again in that sort of pre loading phase. Gotcha. So it's mostly consisting of like squat and gait pattern and plyometric type lifts. But is there, is there any rationale to include things for the upper body or, or anything like that? Or, or is that just generally just potential added bulk that doesn't really help you? Yeah, that's a controversial question. <laughs> Amongst coaches, um, it's, yeah, I would say a point of contention. Um, is this really necessary? You know, you, you need body mass is a good and bad thing in that you lower body mass can be beneficial in powering you forward, but carrying a lot of upper body mass may not be helpful for you. Um, whether or not you really need to have a strong upper body to perform running well, you probably don't. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I don't know that I could objectively demonstrate that it's harmful, you know, if unless you're really putting on significant body mass. So um, I guess what I would say is I don't know because I, I don't think it's really been very well tested. Fair. Yeah, I think real quick, physiologically, I, I do see endurance training as more harmful to lifting performance than I see lifting as physiological harmful to endurance. I see lifting as potentially harmful to endurance when done inappropriately, mm. right? When you put on too mass, right? When we, when we train in a certain way. So and it, Sarah made me think of this, um, and I want to add to the discussion of, of programming I alluded to earlier, like how to structure things within a week and, and accounting for that volume. But the one thing she made me think of was, I would, I would always you know, ask the question when you're doing a concurrent training, are you training in whatever your secondary modality is? Are you training to complete or to compete? Mm. And, you know, I don't know if you remember, Eric, uh, I, I put together a mass video like a couple of years ago, and it was I wrote a whole program on um, how to structure your resistance training if you just want to finish a marathon, like if you just want to train for it. Because um, this is, you know, what I did when before I was training with with uh, uh, Dr. Mahoney and just kind of say, hey, I'm going to go run this marathon. And, you know, people will say, uh, hey, yeah, you, you know, I could I could I ran a marathon and, you know four hours or something like that, which is great. And, uh, you know, it didn't really hurt my lifts or anything like that or not too much, right? Just a little bit. And I say, that's awesome. That is a fantastic accomplishment, but I want you to consider, were you looking to just complete the race or to compete in the race? And there becomes a point with either of them where you're training so much in one, even if you can abide by all of the concurrent training rules, let's say that we talk about in lifting, which is to to you know uh, separate the the running from the lifting by 24 hours try and keep the duration of each one short maybe use you know multiple uh sessions so that you don't uh, increase your your time uh, your continuous time running only so long not to negatively affect the lifting if you do all of those rules eventually if you want a marathon and you're trying to get really good and you're running you know 40 50 60 70 80 miles per week it doesn't matter um, it's too much to be able to continue to, to increase your squat. Even if you say, all right, I'm just going to do heavy singles on the squat twice a week and reduce my volume. You can sustain for a little while, but just something's going to have to give eventually just because of the time you're doing it. And the same thing with if you're lifting. When I started getting back into this a year and a half ago, you know, I had a, a, a back injury I was dealing with. So for the whole year and a half before that, I said, hey, I'm just going to train like a bodybuilder. And naturally, I'm not I don't weigh that much. And, uh, but I was up to about 190 pounds. I remember selling Sarah. I was like, I feel like I'm lumbering along here as we're getting started, but I'm down into the lowish to mid one fifties now. Um, which is more typical how I, how I used to be really before I started lifting. And, um, 
you know, so at, at that point, I was still trying to maintain lifting to a certain degree because I was struggling to give it up. I felt like I should be doing this, right? This feels wrong to, uh, to not be doing this. Um, but at, at a certain point, we started doing more and we started getting more miles every week, whatever we started with, with less than 20 maybe and, and so forth. And I think now we're, we're in the 60s and it would just not be possible. Um, to do that mentally, physically, just the fatigue from one, even it, to the other. So are you training to compete or to complete? And you can complete something without having the one discipline harm the other that much, right? And that's still a very, very cool thing to do, right? To say, hey, I'm doing both of these things and I'm, I'm pretty decent at them. Um, I actually did a bench only meet um, the same week that I did a marathon years ago. Um, and it was, it was, it was awesome right? It was super cool. But like, I was very mediocre at both of them. Um, mediocre to terrible, let's say on that on that scale. So are you are you training to compete or to complete, which I think is, uh, you know, an important distinction. And so when you structure your, your, your lifting, we talk about all the time, like, hey, let's say we want to manage training to failure, because training to failure on Monday might cause fatigue that bleeds into Wednesday. And then maybe you can't squat again till Friday. Whereas if you train at a, you know, a six, seven RPE on Monday squat, you can squat again Wednesday and squat again Friday. Now you've actually done more total volume throughout the week because you took it a little easier one day. Same thing if we want to program in the cardio for lifting, we say, well, let's look at our week. Okay, our heavy squats tomorrow. So I'm not going to do the hit, the hit today, uh, 24 hours before the, the heavy squats, right? So when I think about running, and uh, I think about a running program, I just, just speak to what we're doing, Sarah, and, and at higher levels, it's certainly gonna change. Um, but if you have a bunch of, you know, is what we're doing pretty, pretty typical, about six days a week for, for somebody? So if you have somebody running six days per week and they have, you know, four of those days, at least for me, are easy running, uh, one of them tends to be a hard workout and the other one tends to be a really long run. And so if we have a long run on a weekend of, of 16 miles, I'm not going to do the lifting on Friday the day before. If I have a hard workout on Wednesday, which I do in two days, I have a, a, a ton of intervals coming up. I'm not going to do the lifting super hard on Tuesday. I, I'm going to do it, let's say, on a Monday, like I'm off today. So where am I going to program it? Just like I'm going to manage how I go to failure on lifting, I'm going to mar- manage where I do that cardio. Well, let's say I have a hard workout Wednesday, a long run on Friday. I'm going to place my lifting for, for, for running maybe on Monday. And then maybe on Thursday or something, because I'm done with the Wednesday workout. And then I have the Saturday long run coming up. So, and then I I place it in the course of the week. I say, all right, I have a really long run this weekend. Instead of doing those eccentric step downs on the bench, I'm just going to do some more regular goblet squats or something else to minimize the damage. So I think a lot of it is just when I said at the beginning of the podcast, like how you program it within a week. For any lifters trying to conceptualize it, think about how you allocate your volume. Hey, I'm not going to do... RDLs today because those are super damaging and I have heavy squats in 48 hours. Rather, I might do another hamstring exercise today, right? For, for runners, I'm not going to do these eccentric step downs today because I have a long run in 24 to 48 hours. I'll move those to earlier in the week where it's farther away from that workout or that long run. So I think that's what's most important is, is how you're, you're, what are you doing it for? You're doing it to help your running, not for the sake of lifting in and of itself. Makes a lot of sense. I think conceptually, that's really helpful with, with those parallels. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I think something that was a eye opener for me was when my I have some cousins who are ultra uh, runners, and uh, so so they're they're in the the, the same cult as you. Um, and I I started to realize just how difficult like supplementary training was for them just because of the pure amount of time they had to invest into the type of mileage uh, that, that they were doing. Um, and like, I remember when I was taking Olympic lifting at my most serious, like, I was actually right when I met you, Mike, if you remember, I was doing Olympic lifting after the seminar uh, in, in Australia. I was training six days a week for a total of about 10 hours. And that's a lot of lifting, but that's not that much compared to some other sports. Um, and like my cousins, sometimes they'll be like, oh, I'm training today. So I'm busy. And I'm oh, like, so you're pretty much done for the day. All your free time's gone when you're not at work. So if you could guys could, uh, Sarah, could you conceptualize for, for the listener 
for a pretty serious um, high level ultra runner, how much time per week are they spending out there running or, or training? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so generally highly trained runners will probably spend 10 to 12 hours a week. Um, and then when we get into ultras, that's where you see really serious time commitment. So, um, a, something that's pretty common in the ultra community is doing back to back long runs. Um, and so you might go out and do 25 miles on Saturday and you're going to do it in the trail, which is going to take you a really long time as compared to doing it on the road. And then you might come back on Sunday and do 20, um, you know, and so your time commitment for those really long runs is, you know, you've got four five, six hours, um, for each of those. And so then, during the week, they won't be quite as long. So you'll do, you know, five, eight, 10 miles um, for your weekly runs. Um, but it's at least, yeah, one to two hours a day in in that as well. So yeah, adding lifting onto that is, um, is pretty challenging. And mm. with the athletes that I coach, you know, we don't do a lot of lifting. Um, you know, there's some kind of easy five to 10 minute things you can add on at the end of your run or a few times a week, we'll do a few exercises, but for athletes who are, you know, if you're not a professional athlete, if it's not your full-time job to do this, you know, then you're squeezing all this in around your work and your family and your social life. And often you just have time for one session, you know? And so if you are a runner, you're probably going to use that session to run. Yeah, it, it doesn't seem uncommon to me that it it basically could be a, a part time job, you know, if if you want to take on uh, that type of distance, and and especially if you want to add in the supplementary stuff and do it right. So I think that's just something that lifters probably don't fully conceptualize when you know the longest a session will ever get for us is not actually due to the training; it's due to the resting between it and that one guy who showed up at the gym who never shuts up who you talk to. You know, that's why you spent two hours. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, like the, the, the rest to work ratio is also completely different. Like if you do a hard set of three and then you rest five minutes and you do like we end up, even if you're in good shape, like 80 percent of the time spent in the gym is resting if you're lifting well, weights. Well, and, one thing, well, sorry, one ahead, thing too, is also the the number of days that you train. So if you're a lifter, there are lifters that can be at the highest level. You could do that. And you could train four days a week. That's not the case with mm-hmm. running. I'm I'm a novice at this, and now may, maybe my coach is just insane. I don't know, but um, and I'm training six days per week, right? And so it's also just just the the frequency. That means that if you want to lift, especially multiple times a week, you have to train twice per day, a couple times per week. I'm mm. telling you that. That's difficult, especially as you're, it wasn't that hard for me when I first started because I was running like, okay, three miles in the morning, whatever. It's not, that doesn't take that long. It's very difficult, especially for some people that are going to get up into insane mileage. Then you have to do, I know Sarah, you alluded to this yesterday, um, have some people will just, just do the lifting after they're running in the same, in the same bout, they'll finish their 10, 12, 15 miles, whatever. And then they'll, they'll go lift, which tells you what are they trying to get out of it. They're not worried about lifting the most that they can, right? Because there's no way that you can do that. But th- just think about the frequency. And then that means with that, with your job, with your family, whatever, you then have to make time for a second session. So it's not just the total time in one bout. It's the fact that you have to do that. Uh, you have to do two a days almost every time you lift weights. Whereas for lifting, if you're, if you're bodybuilding training for a show, sure, you may do two a days uh, uh, a lot in those situations. But you can get away with a lot of lifters training three, four times per week. And then if you want to do cardio, do it on an off day and it's no big deal. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's I think that's really good perspective just to see um, why maybe lifting, despite the potential benefits that you guys talked about physiologically and improving, uh, you know, stiffness and running economy. It's probably not going to improve your running as much as, oh, I don't know, running. So I can understand why. <laughs> why when you're doing such a high volume of this that it is of course there's a lot of variability and it's not ubiquitous that everyone uh lifts because heck like if you just don't have the time to do it you're gonna have to make a triage based decision yeah for sure so we've covered a fair amount of uh fair amount of ground we've talked about the number of days per week 
Um, we've talked a little bit about um, uh, the, uh, the periodization of what it looks like going up to a meet. Uh, Mike, you started to talk about something I wanted to touch on is the, uh, the order of training. <clears throat> so if, you've, if you're always doing essentially a two-a-day when you decide to lift, what makes more sense? Are we lifting right after running? Are we lifting later in the day? Uh, how are these two-a-days structured in the way that, that gives you the best uh, pros and cons? Well, I'll talk about how I think they should be structured, but then I'd, I'd want to kick it to Sarah to talk, to ask her, I would pose a question to her is what do runners actually do? And this mm -hmm. is why I think for everybody listening, it's, it's really important that, that Dr. Mahoney is here because, you know, she has her pulse on the running community. And so like in iron, in iron culture on this podcast, like, you know, and, and Eric, we can talk about, we can talk about science and that's great, but we're, we, we've all actually been in the lifting community for years. So we understand mm. how that translates and we can talk about that. I don't have that, that, that ability in, in running yet, but Sarah does. So let me, let me try to answer from what I think it should look like. And then she can correct me if I'm wrong on how that translates and what it actually does. And I do think that's really important. So I would say that ideally just thinking physiologically, you wouldn't want to finish your run then immediately go left. I don't see why you would want to do this. It doesn't seem to make sense. Just thinking if you finish a really long run, the fatigue that you have, and then you're going to have to keep the focus to stabilize and put all your force into, let's say, a split squat or a step up or a step down and try not to injure yourself doing that. Try not to make a misstep after you've been out on the road or on the trails for a very long time running and the fatigue that you have. Certainly the amount of weight that you're lifting is going to be lower. Now that that might not change that much because somebody might not care the load that they're lifting uh, too much in that case. But just from a focus perspective, and I, I do think that inevitably, because I have tried this after some runs and it never goes well, the effort that you're putting into it is lower, right? That The simple effort that I'm putting into lifting when I say, hey, I'm going to do it right after a run today, it's just non-existent. Right. I've, I've, you know, finished out, you know, uh, an eight mile, 10 mile, whatever. And I say, okay, here, I'm going to get my 30 minutes of this. And now it doesn't go well. Um, so ideally you split it up, but what's the issue with that? When you split it up, right. By that point, oh, I have to get this in. I have to go, uh, as I mused to you guys before this, there's a two hour kindergarten pickup line today. I have to go sit in. And so how am I going to, uh, uh go and do that? Uh, if I, if I get this extra workout in later, right, I'm not going to go, you know, late, later at night, you know, spending time with the family, whatever it might be, and, and that sort of thing. So how are you going to work that in physiologically and scientifically? It makes sense to split it up. You have your, again, let's say I'm just using a schedule that I know. And if you're training, uh, uh, you know, Tuesday through Saturday or Tuesday through Sunday, I have a hard workout Wednesday, I have a long run on, on Saturday. I'm going to structure my training, my lifting, so it doesn't interfere with my hard workout on Wednesday and with my long run on Saturday. Similarly to how I would structure lifting so that it doesn't interfere with my heavy. Work. I'm not going to do a damaging good morning 48 hours before I'm supposed to squat heavy. I'm not going to do this lifting 24, 48 hours right before I'm supposed to go and, and crush this workout. So I plan around those, those days. So let's say in that case, if I have Wednesdays and Saturdays are my big days for running. Mondays and Thursdays might be the days that I do some lifting. Monday, I'm going to do a little bit more than I do on Thursday, because Thursday I'm probably covering from the Wednesday workout a little bit. Um, and keep in mind on that Thursday, you're still running. You're running in the morning and then you're, you're still lifting after that. Um, and so for those that are, that are lifters, you might, you might run a lot of miles and you might do a seven, eight, nine, 10 mile run the day after a really hard run or a long run, but that's, that's a recovery run, right? You're just kind of trotting out there, just going through it. Um, it's not like lifting where you're super fatigued from squatting, have a ton of damage. Um, and you say, Hey, I'm going to go in and just squat a bunch of sets of five at 70%. That honestly isn't the worst idea, but we typically don't do that. Um, it, it's different. So I think how you structure it. So ideally you'd split it up in my opinion. That's what makes the most sense for the volume that you can lift for the power that you could put into it for the effort that you could put forth and just to not have the lifting itself injure you because you're not fatigued from just being out on the road for an hour or two. That being said, I would ask Sarah, what, what do people actually do? <laughs> yeah. Let me just like step all over what you just said. <laughs> yeah. It's trash. Amateur. 
what a joke this guy is. Uh, no, I mean, that totally makes sense physiologically. Um, and it's interesting, you know, from your perspective, lifting is this sacred, important thing that we really need to, you know, put our full effort into. And I think from a running perspective, a lot of runners are like, oh, this extra thing I have to add on to my day. Like, let me quick do this. Um, and so it's a really different um, even just emotional weight that you put on that. Like, I don't think a lot of runners are super jazzed about their lift. Um, you might have some, but not a lot of them. Um, what is interesting is there's definitely variability, but I would say what's relatively common, even in elite and pro runners is to do your heavy lift immediately after your hard interval workout. Mm -hmm. Um, you see that a lot. And, you know, there's, there's some, some explanation for why that is. Um, I think runners are really protective of their recovery days um, and their, their recovery time. Um, there are a lot of runners that run twice a day, most days of the week. Um, and so there's so much running volume that you really want all your hard stuff to be concentrated so that you have those easy days to recover. So some of it is kind of just trying to squish all the hard stuff together so that you have recovery time after. Um, some of it is the athletes choose to do it that way. Um, they maybe feel like, hey, this is my hard day. I'm already in it. I'm already up to go really hard. Let me just keep going through this and not have to gear myself up again later. Um, and so they like just viewing it as one big workout rather than here's my running workout here's my lifting workout. It's all just, Hey, we're going hard today. Um, certainly, I mean, I agree with Mike that that's not going to allow you to lift optimally, but that's not necessarily the goal. Um, you know, in that the, the numbers themselves don't matter for the sake of themselves. Um, but I do think there's an argument for if you did that in a more rested state, that still could be more beneficial. So some of that is culture. Um, you know, this is what everybody does, and it may not be the most scientifically sound way to do that. I, I, I wonder, just pick up on that, though. So even though it's not the most scientifically sound way, um, Sarah, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there's a, uh, uh, when it comes to lifting weights, there's a pyramid of things that are important. and. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's like a it's a hierarchy system mm -hmm. of uh, the things that you'd want to focus on. It sounds and perhaps, ingenious the way it was set up, really. Really, right? Yeah, it's very original. Nobody's ever drew, drew shapes before, and uh, and one of the most important things on this uh, pyramid, super original, is uh, adherence. I believe is that right, Eric? Can you confirm? Oh, of course, I, okay. I definitely can confirm that. Uh, I think if you didn't include that in the pyramid, you'd be foolish. It'd be awful, right? Mm. No, nobody would want to read that. And uh, they, they, they came for the foreword. They stayed for the book. And uh, when <laughs> they, uh, so when we think about adherence on the pyramid, I wonder if what you're describing, Sarah, it's while it may be good to wait or a better idea to wait, how many runners would actually go back and do it? Are they just more likely to do it, do something if they're doing it right then? Because then I don't know about you, like, I, I do feel, although sometimes I feel like I, uh, my focus would, would, would lose if I go lift right afterwards, the more miles that, that we run, the less likely I want to go lift weights later in the day. And I don't just mean on a day, just overall. You know, like, like, I, like no, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Like, throughout the day, yeah, I just feel, feel tired later. So I wonder if that's a, if that's an adherence thing. If, we, if there was a, a research study looking at that and it left people to their own devices, mm -hmm. hey, you, you can do it now. Uh, you can do it later. Um, maybe, maybe there's three groups, right? A group that has to do it at this time, a group that has to do it later, separated six hours, and then there's a group that can choose um, and seeing what the, uh, what the end result is. So I wonder if that's an, just simply an adherence thing. Uh, and if they're able to adhere to it, then at least they're going to get some of the benefits from it. So I, I don't know. Yeah, it's a reasonable hypothesis. Yeah, yeah. Put it in put it into shape and see if people catch on. <laughs> I'm sure they would. Um, if they used a pyramid, though, and I didn't write it, they'd get sued. Mm. But mm. that's neither here nor there. Um, no, I think that's really interesting. Like, if, if it is the question of, 
it's not about when's the best time to do it. It's when is the time that I'm going to do it at all? You know, I yeah. think that's fair. No, there's no question about it. Uh, can I bring up one, one thing that I think is tangentially related to this? Tangent away. Cool. So, uh, you know, at the, at the beginning, I, this came to mind right at the beginning of the podcast. And this isn't necessarily about uh, running or lifting weights, but it's just about coaching in general. And the one thing, so I don't know, I think I shared this uh, with you, Sarah, a while back, but since I started being an athlete, or you've called me an athlete, I don't think that's the case, but since I started being on the other side of the coach relationship where you coach me and I do the training, right? I'm the athlete, if you will. It has made me a far better coach of my lifting. Because I've gotten to see how this works from the other side. I've been coaching lifters now online for like 10, 10-ish years or so. And, you know, as time goes on, you become, and you don't have anybody coach you, you become more disconnected from what the athlete, it, him or herself, is thinking. And so I would, I would see the responses. I would send an email or whatever it might be, and then athletes would respond right away. And I could tell we're very enthused. And sometimes I would think, why are you so enthused to hear from me? And like, like, right? But like, if I have a super challenging session, like, and then like, I wake up, I see Sarah's feedback the next morning because she stays up to like 3 a.m. And I wake up, I wake up like 30 minutes after that. Um, but whenever like the next morning, I'll see, oh, I have an email. Okay, like, what does she think of that session? I'll be like, if I have a super hard session, I'm, I'm psyched to see what did my coach think, right? How does she think I did that day? And uh, so I, it's made me a far better communicator, I think, just from being on the other side of this relationship with my athletes. Because I start to, to know what they think, what they want, how they're going to respond. I, I'm understanding that they may be excited to get their new week of training from me. And so it's made me you know, maybe put more effort into that or focus more on the email that I'm targeting to them and just making sure I can communicate with them uh, in certain ways because I'm trying to understand how they're viewing it now. For me, it's like, okay, I have this. I'm going to put the training. Here you go. There's what you got next week. But for them, they're excited. Well, now I'm on the other side of it. I'm the person excited to get the training. And so I feel it's really helped make me a better coach. So for anybody who's who's uh, coaching out there and doesn't have anybody then they don't have a coach themselves. Um, I would I would say two things. One, understand what your athletes are doing. But two, it's probably not a bad idea to have a coach. Just not only because it's always better to have somebody else do your own training, but it'll probably make you a better coach. And then you can pick up on some of those tendencies from your coach, what you like and that sort of thing, and put them into your training. So I don't know just an observation that wasn't an intended benefit of me from me when I started this journey, uh, but has certainly helped, I think. So I don't know if anybody else shares those thoughts or has observed something similar to that and what they do, or if you have you know, people that, that coach you. I don't know if anybody else here has a coach and they're just fun, but it's helpful. 100%, Mike. I have had um, multiple coaches over the years from working collaboratively with the rest of the Team 3DMJ folks. Berto is normally my quote-unquote head coach while I do bodybuilding preps. And then um, Dr. Adam Story, who is my secondary supervisor, my PhD with you, he coached me for a couple of years when I was getting or trying to get serious into Olympic weightlifting. Um, and those were very valuable experiences for exactly the same reasons. I, I could reiterate what you said, but I would just be literally reiterating what you said, so I won't. But yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a, a very accurate comment in my experience. Cool. So one, one other thing I was actually wanting to talk about, we were, we were discussing exercise selection and I, we kind of, uh, didn't fully cover that, I would say. We talked about how upper body training, a little bit of controversy there, whether it's worth it or not. I was wondering specifically about the range of motion in lower body training. Um, given if we're, if we're trying to get uh, transfer and uh, making yourself more powerful while running, you know, you're never in a deep squat position, hopefully, uh, during a run uh, or something that's gone wrong um, or you're running up a very steep hill. Um, so I wonder, uh, I, I've seen in some, uh, sprinting programs that half squats or quarter squats are quite common is, is the idea here that we're trying to get more transfer at the specific joint angles, or do you recommend training at a full range of motion? 
uh, or is it very much just dependent on the individual and what range of motion they have? Because obviously in powerlifting, there's a depth requirement. And in bodybuilding, we have data to suggest that when training at long muscle lengths, uh, you know, improves hypertrophy outcomes. So there's a rationale for lifting with the ranges of motion uh, that we see in, in lifting. But I, I don't I don't know the answer for for when we're looking at uh, endurance athletes. So so what is the thought process there? Hmm. Well, what I would say is, you know, if you look at the running lifting literature, that there is not enough data to give you a clear answer. You know, mm -hmm. I think we are just still trying to decide even what exercises at all should be included and what is a prescription that is effective in this population. Um, so to be able to differentiate how full of a range of motion you would go with each exercise, I don't think there's enough published data to answer that question. Um, I think what you have is a lot of individual variation. Um, and I, like, I think there's definitely athletes and coaches who would approach it from the perspective of, yes, let's mimic the running motion as much as possible. And others who would be more of the perspective of, no, I just need these muscle groups to be strong and I'm not right. going to worry that it directly transfers, um, in that way. So I think you would see both. Um, mm -hmm. and I, you know, and then maybe Mike has seen different research than I have. Uh, but I don't know that we could answer that question with solid data. For sure. Yeah, I think it's exactly right. We, we just don't have the data from what I've seen. You know, we can theorize, theorize a little bit as Sarah just did, which is, you know, if, I think, Eric, I don't know if you remember the author or not, but Greg reviewed a study in mass not too long ago, which looked at different ranges of motion, full range of motion, and then um, just kind of at the lockout, and then let's say out of the bottom of the lift. And the results tend to be uh, specific to the test, right? So if you're looking to get strong just on the top half of the lift, either training just the top half of the lift, uh, is probably going to be most beneficial for that. So like if you want to get the best that you can at a three board press um, doesn't doesn't mean that a regular bench press couldn't be helpful, but it means that you should train a three board press um, and train the top half of the movement. So for running, you know, as you guys talked about, a a partial squat, which you know we we tend to that has a negative connotation in our community, right? You say the term partial squat and people freak out, but it's it's uh it's kind of hilarious in a way because people do two and three board bench presses all the time. So it is a, a study from, I don't know what, six, seven years ago from, uh, from my buddy, uh, Caleb, uh, Basler at all. And, uh, he looked at partial squats to help improve, uh, squat water M and it was beneficial. Um, I believe it, uh, uh, the P value wasn't quite significant, but it was pretty close. And so in terms of running, it makes sense logically to say, Hey, especially depending upon let's say you want to maybe limit the time under tension, limit the muscle damage that's involved in the movement. Uh, and so it makes sense logically to say, hey, I'm going to squat only to this depth um, and maybe set the box there or the pins there so I can pop right back up or I'm doing, you know, any other squat variation. Maybe you're doing a, a goblet squat or something like that. Personally, I found that staying away from the traditional barbell movements um, when I've been lifting nowadays it just makes me do it more because it's less time consuming. It's easier for me to go pick up a dumbbell and do some squats. And as Sarah said, what are you trying to get out of it? Right. Well, I'm just trying to get generally stronger. Right. And so, um, is there going to be a direct transfer from squatting higher, let's say to running performance? I, I can't say that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not an illogical thought uh, sure. to, to be able to do that. For, and so it would, I, I see a clear rationale. I can write that intro in my head if I'm writing that paper. I see a rationale to test that. Absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and yeah, I, I was talking about specificity in my, my, my question, but it's a really good point as well that, you know, the bottom of a squat is when you're going to be the longest muscle lengths, when you're going to incur more damage. And if we are really trying to balance this high training load that you guys have, uh, you know, shared with us is can basically be a part-time job, then for sure, you don't want to elongate that recovery time course for a, a questionable benefit. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, we've covered a lot of ground. We've, we've talked about periodization. We've talked about volume, intensity, frequency, days of the week, middle distance versus long distance, physiological rationale of why we'd even lift. Um, 
So in my mind, we've done a really good job, but I also know nothing about this topic. So I just want to uh, have um, the last question for you both is just to open the floor to say, hey, is there, are there any gaps in this conversation that you think our listeners would benefit from uh, that you guys want to potentially uh, touch on before we, before we wrap up this great episode? We did cover a lot. The other thing I was thinking of um, that could really be helpful for runners is um, in the literature shows that lifting does reduce uh, rating of perceived exertion at a given workload. And running performance is a really cognitive, centrally mediated thing. And so Mm -hmm. if there's anything that you can do that reduces your rating of perceived exertion at a given workload, that could translate to a performance benefit. Um, And so even if you don't see your squat go up or you don't see a lot of hypertrophy, which you may not want anyway, but if it makes the running feel a little bit easier, um, that actually in itself could lead to a performance enhancement. Makes a lot of sense. The last thing that I would say is, is more of a general statement on if you're why are we doing especially in lifting why are we doing some of the things we do we enjoy it we like it you know but nobody's nobody's paying us for that right um or i was i always keep in mind that the one of the people in the fitness industry if you will that's been most transformative for me was brian whitaker and uh he gave a he gave a talk in 2012 Lane Norton's first bodybuilding camp, which I was invited to speak at, and was super honored to do that. And uh, Brian gave a talk, and he looked around the room, and he said, "How many of you make a living from bodybuilding?" And uh, a couple of people, you know, started to raise their hand. He said, "No, no, no, I'm not talking about coaching or whatever," which was different at the time, ten years ago. He said, "How many people make a living from bodybuilding? You get paid to compete." Zero people raised their hand, and he said, "So, what are you doing this for?" Right, you enjoy it, you like it, take it for what it's worth. And so, this is stretching that a little bit, but I've always kept that with me and thought, like, if if you're interested in running or endurance and you're a lifter, or you're a runner and you're interested in lifting, try it. Mm. Do that. There's nothing wrong with that. If you're a lifter and you're worried that running a few miles per week, if you enjoy that, or cycling or whatever is going to have negative consequences for your physique. Trust me, running a few miles a week isn't a big deal. It's not going to have super negative consequences on your physique. Running 80 miles a week will. uh, But, you know, how you go about it. Besides, one of the things I I talk about, if somebody wants to get ready for, you know, some sort of race, and Sarah talked about this too, if you want to be really good at a mile, you could probably do that pretty well and still be a pretty good lifter. Um, But if you wanted to run a marathon, you could train for that completed in a year and your physique and your strength would be pretty fine as long as you went about it in a smart way. Besides, if you're young, not, not like Eric, but if you're young, that would, be, that would be one year in your life. Let's say maybe you got ready for that marathon and, and then your lifts would be fine after that. So why are you in this? If you're in this to enjoy it and to be part of the culture and really do it, It's another athletic endeavor. If you're a runner and you're saying, hey, this looks cool, I'd like to put on some more muscle mass, go for it, right? You know, obviously we talked about earlier, if you're at the highest level of whatever you're doing, don't go for that because you want to win, right? You want to win or you're going to make money. But if you're you're not, you're most people, give it a shot, right? And I know that's part of what I had to get over. I, I really wanted to do what I'm doing now, but I felt like I couldn't. And then I was like, nobody cares. Nobody, right? Nobody, literally nobody cares, right? I, but I want to do this. So just go for it. And so if you, if you're in, in one discipline and you want to do the other for a little bit, give it a shot. You can always go back and do the other thing. And uh, it's super cool to have different experiences. So um, that would be my final piece. Well, Omar, I think we got to close this out before he poaches too many of our of the Iron Cult into the uh, into the, the, this cult that they're they're both selling so so voraciously. Uh, no, but in all seriousness, I think I think everyone understands exactly what what Doctor Rodos is saying, and uh, we couldn't agree more. Uh, you got to do you, uh, even if there's very few of you out there who do what he do, but you still got to do you if you know what I'm saying. So with that uh, very clear uh, ending statement by myself, Omar, why don't you ride us into the sunset? Well, as my esteemed colleague would say, you people are all right. 
Uh, I learned that throughout this episode. And maybe uh, we could best put it as yay do yay, unless your name mm. is yay, in which case you probably shouldn't do what yay thinks. Um, I do I think this is an enlightening episode for those that maybe want to dibble dabble. And that's why I gave the example of that middle distance, because I really do see, and Eric alluded to it, that uh, part-time job, as he said, where when I think to myself, 10, 15, 20, 30 hours uh, uh, per week, it does seem daunting if you want to do, especially in addition to your lifting. So I think there's so many practical takeaways. I think also if some of the cult look deep within themselves, they probably have seen maybe a potential interest at some point in their life in maybe one such endeavor, such as endurance training. So, hey, this was the most inviting cult. Uh, the spaceships, the Kool-Aid, everything else is in the second, third, fourth speech, but it sounds enticing right now. I want to thank both Dr. Sarah Mahoney and also Dr. Michael Zordos for being part of the Iron Cult. Once again, if you enjoyed this episode, you could go ahead and leave a rating review on iTunes. The typical rating review, five stars. I let you form your own conclusion what you should leave, but hey, <laughs> the answer is obvious. We'll be back every single Monday. Myself and Eric now have to do the opposite of endurance training, and that is get that damn pump and get those gains. So we'll see you every single Monday.